everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Adventures in Machine Learning. I'm one of your hosts, Michael Burke, and I'm joined by my other host, Ben Wilson. And today we have a, a really, really exciting guest. This is going to be a fun talk, to say the least. Um, Charles Simon. He's a serial entrepreneur. Um, he founded Vectron Graphics, which was one of the world's first CAD companies. Um, he also founded GiftCertificates.com, which was then sold to AOL. Um, he has numerous awards, but I think most impressively, both to me and Ben, is that he's an extreme sailor and has circumnavigated North America. Hey folks, this is Charles Maxwood from Top End Devs, and lately I've been working on actually building out Top End Devs. If you're interested, you can go to topendevs.com slash podcast, and you can actually hear a little bit more about my story, about why I'm doing what I'm doing with Top End Devs, why I changed it from uh, devchat.tv to Top End Devs, but... What I really want to get into is that I have decided that I'm going to build the platform that I always wished I had with devchat.tv, and I renamed it to Top End Devs because I want to give you the resources that are going to help you to build the career that you want, right? So whether you want to be an influencer in tech, whether you want to go and just max out your salary and then go live a lifestyle with your family, your friends, or just traveling the world or whatever, I, I want to give you the resources that are going to help you do that. We're going to have career and leadership resources in there, and we're going to be giving you content on a regular basis to help you level up and max out your career. So go check it out at topendevs.com. If you sign up before my birthday, that's December 14th. If you sign up before my birthday, you can get 50% off the lifetime of your subscription. Once again, that's topendevs.com. So Charles, uh, did I miss anything? Do you mind uh, elaborating on any of those points? Well, let me, let me start off with a little background on, on my early background, which is, uh, of course, I started playing with computers when I was in high school, but then I went to uh, the University of California, got a degree in electrical engineering. So my background is engineering. But uh, even while I was in school, I was in Silicon Valley as a semiconductor test technician, that is a lab technician, where at that time you'd get the chips for back from the foundry, the very first set, and people were working with microscopes, actually cutting the traces and on the metal on the chips to be able to correct for the for the design errors. But uh, uh, subsequent to that, I uh, su subsequently got a master's degree in uh, computer science and uh, got a lot of interest in robotics. But all the time I've been interested in, in the overall picture of whether or not we'll be able to make machines think. And that was the uh, thesis of the very early uh, Turing article in the 1950s that uh, uh, was the progenitor to the Turing test that says not only if you can machines think, but how are you going to know if they do? And uh, so that's where I've been, been uh, focusing my efforts for a long time. And uh, as Michael said, I started off with Vectron Graphics and CAD CAM, and one of the things that we noticed was that the classical algorithms for, uh, this was in designing printed circuit boards, the classical algorithms really had very little to do with people who were doing manual design at the time. Well, now we've got machines that are so powerful that manual design is almost a completely a thing of the past, and it's all done by machine. But uh, that, I found that to be an intriguing problem, that uh, how are we going to address the question and bridge the gap between people and machines? And uh, uh, I worked at a lot of different places, in, in, sometimes between entrepreneurships. I'd you know, take jobs here and there. I worked at Microsoft for a number of years where uh, I managed what was at the time a brand new concept in the uh, World Wide Web, where uh, it was uh, initially MSN News. MSN was their uh, equivalent to AOL. And MSN News, they, you know, they woke up in, with the Windows 95 launch and decided they actually w needed to embrace the internet. And the problem with the internet was that there was not any content that anybody was interested in so they endeavored to make their own content with MSN, which was the Microsoft network. 
And they entered into a partnership with uh, NBC, and uh, this subsequently became NB MSNBC. Uh, but at the time, MSNBC.com was in Redmond on the Microsoft campus, and the television studios was were and that still are at uh, Secaucus, New Jersey, and. Uh, it was a very interesting match. It was fascinating because, of course, at the time, NBC was owned by General Electric, and General Electric was a hard and fast Unix site uh, community, and they would not allow any Windows machines in their <laughs> shop without special permission and dispensation and forms and circles and arrows. And you can get an idea of how, how smoothly this worked together because <laughs> Microsoft, of course, was not going to allow any Unix machines in their offices. <laughs> uh, but so my job was, was to, to manage this, this collection of, you know, herding cats to be able to get the news site off the ground. But very rapidly, it was the largest news site on the web at the time. We were one of the very first sites to ever break a million unique users in a day. And it was just an adventure, but we had to do all kinds of things like, uh, I mean, solve problems that you don't even think are problems today. Like if you want to post stuff to a web, a big website, which is going to span multiple servers, how do you make sure that all of the content shows up on all of the servers at the same time? So if you change the links over here, somebody can't get routed to another server and and get a broken link well we had to had to invent that kind of stuff it wasn't uh, it didn't exist at the time so i say that that was a fascinating adventure uh, subsequent to that i got a contract developing uh, a lot of neurological test software and the very first piece of that was one of the very first paperless electroencephalographs now an electroencephalograph is where you see what measures brain waves, and you get the, where you see the guy with all of the electrodes on his head. That's an electroencephalograph, and it's used for sleep studies and and uh, uh, working on brain injuries and as uh, curing epilepsy uh, and a whole slew of other other things. And these essentially were strip chart recorders originally, like uh, you'd imagine in uh, like like a uh, a lie detector. Bouncing needles. And these would be, to make this paperless, because they just generated reams of paper, uh, you could computerize the whole thing, and then you could do all kinds of things, like store the raw data so that you could change the filtering after the fact and change the, the way you summed the or took differences on the uh, various signals in order to determine, for example, the location of an epileptic seat of an epileptic seizure or something like that. And uh, that subsequently morphed into a number of other neurological test systems, like tests for, neuro for uh, carpal tunnel syndrome, tests for various forms of deafness, uh, tests for epilepsy, and things like that. A fascinating idea. Uh, you have to understand that an electroencephalograph, you get all of these signals coming in. Overwhelming majority of, of it is simply noise. And you, there are so many neurons firing in your brain, and they each one give off a, a tiny amount of, of detectable signal because, they, I mean, they, there's not a lot of energy going on in your brain. As you know, the whole, the whole brain runs on you know, 12 watts of energy, otherwise your, your head would explode. Uh, but fascinating is if you, for example, played clicks into, into earphones and you synchronized your, um, your view of the neurons, of these, these electron, electrodes, if you synchronize that with the clicks, and you averaged over thousands of samples, all of the noise would be filtered out and you could observe the firing of individual neurons in the chain of the process that actually uh, is part of hearing. And that's how they would determine, well, if you have a hearing loss, it may be at this part of your 
in your ear or in your cochlea or in some part of the auditory nerve or something. You've got to figure out where it, where the problem is before you can attack a solution. So uh, carpal tunnel syndrome, typically you put electrodes on a person's hand and you measure the actual signal going up their arm and you can calculate the uh, the amount of nerve conduction. So the, the point of this is that I got a real interest in what neurons could do and how neurons actually work and what they're good for. And I wrote a little neuron simulator called Brain Simulator. And I wrote the original one in, in 1988. And it would handle 1,200 neurons and this was an interesting thing you could play with, but you can't actually do much calculation in 1,200 neurons. Um, and then I put that aside for a while, and as, as you two mentioned, I did a lot of sailing. And uh, then I got back to, uh, actually, it was still while I was sailing that I started writing Brain Simulator 2, because now we have machines where you can put a billion neurons on a computer and uh, you get all of these multiple processors and you can get a lot of work done in, in, on a desktop. And so I, I wrote the original brain, the first of the brain simulator two in, uh, when was that, 2017, and started playing. And because, you know, I'm a, a, an engineer at heart, let's say, how, what are the kinds of things you can do with neurons that you can't do with other things and what is easy and what is difficult and what can you do with a small number of neurons and what takes a lot. And in building a neuron simulator, you can think of it as being a lot like, uh, electrical engineers will understand this, it's a digital logic simulator where you can build up a circuit and it will tell you what it does. Most, a lot of computer science guys have never seen a logic simulator, but, but it's, uh, a really handy way if you're going to do a circuit to verify that it's actually going to do what you expect before you get too far down the road with building it. Uh, and so now I have a logic circuit simulator that instead of working with logic components actually works with neurons. And that supports a number of different models of neurons. And then you play with this for years saying, can you build logic gates out of neurons? And the answer is yes, you can build NAND gates out of neurons. So if you can build a NAND gate out of a neuron, you could you know, potentially build a, a, uh, an entire CPU out of neurons. And then you do a little arithmetic on how slow this CPU would be. And you decide that that's not a particularly useful path, but it's an interesting, uh, interesting direction of thought. So you go uh, thinking about, well, how do neurons actually learn things? And the general consensus is that, and this is true in the machine learning world, is that a lot of information is represented in the weights of the synapses between the neurons. Now, neurons have a very simple function. A neuron accumulates a charge. If the charge exceeds a threshold, it emits a spike. The spike travels down the axon to the the synapses that connect it to neur other neurons, and this process goes on. And in your neocortex, which we think is the thinking part of your brain, this represents, uh, you know, 16 uh, billion neurons. And so there's a lot of capability, but the, the, the process of thought, we believe happens in the neocortex. And so the question arises, how can you build thinking out of these simple components? And what must the circuitry be like? And uh, there are some things that neurons are really good at. For example, they can, a single neuron can tell you the distinction between the relative spike rates of two different incoming signals. And so, for example, the signal coming from the retina in your eye to adjacent pixels, if you're firing at different frequencies, there's likely a boundary there. And so neurons are really good at detecting boundaries. On the other hand, 
if you want to know what the absolute firing frequency is out of this incoming signal from your retina, it takes a separate neuron for each different level you want to be able to detect. And so you get some interesting optical illusion cases because you can only detect on the order of 10 different shades of brightness. But you can detect the boundaries between different shades of brightness with much more precision than that. And so your mind is having to cope with, yeah, I can detect this boundary, but both sides of the boundary seem like they're about the same color. And, and you get a lot of interesting illusions out of that. So inference of a sort. Yeah. <laughs> like we have to because of the, the information volume in our own Exactly. And then it, it occurs that every optical illusion is a clue to how your mental processes work. So if, if you look at any optical illusion, some of them are 3D and they tell you how your 3D system works. And there, there are color illusions and they tell you a lot about how your color perception works. And... Uh, so while though they're, they're interesting, you can look at them as, as how do you build, uh, how do you build up a mental, uh, how do you build up a model of, of how is the brain working? And then we get to machine learning, and, and this is the machine learning channel, and, and you begin to actually try to produce machine learning algorithms in these neuron models. And for a variety of reasons, you can't. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons is that the primary reason, and this is, I mean, it, I should say theoretically, it's no problem because theoretically, the typical neural network of perceptrons is what, what is called a functionally complete set, which means you can build any digital circuit out of it. And likewise, the neuron forms a functionally complete set. So from a theoretical perspective, you can build anything out of anything. But in biological neurons, the neurons are so slow that to build a lot of functionality uh, uh, is, if, if you start thinking about machine learning kinds of algorithms, the systems are simply going to be too slow to be useful. Uh, and to give you a, a little example on this, uh, there are a couple of different ways you might encode a signal in a, in a sequence of neurons. Remember, the neuron is simply emitting pulses. And I should say, the neurons are so slow. Let me give you a little specific on that. Um, the neuron's maximum firing rate is about 250 hertz. This is... Uh, you know, 250 times a second is at once every four milliseconds. And once the process is initiated of creating a spike, uh, the system, the, the neuron can't accept any other input until it recovers. And it recovers and it's all moving ions back and forth and changing the orientation and location of ions. And it has... It's a, we call it a, we'd call it electrochemical, but it's not an electronic device. And the signal of a neuron, the, the spike, actually travels down the axon to adjacent neurons at about one meter per second. This is like a moderate walking speed. There's uh, we can we sometimes think of this as being electronic because we can measure the electrical charge, but that's only a symptom. The actual function is chemical, and it is many, many orders of magnitude slower than a, an electronic circuit. In fact, when, I should say, when I was an undergraduate, it was at the time when uh, telephone switching circuits were giving way from being made out of electric mechanical relays and becoming transistorized. And so there were a slew of cast off electromechanical relays available. And a number of my cohorts and I in electrical en engineering built a CPU out of telephone relays. Now a telephone relay 
if you apply power to it, the switch actually closes some amount later because of mechanical lag of actually building up the magnetic field and actually moving the contacts around. And that lag on the on the on the relays we had was 12 milliseconds. And when you stop to think about it, that means that the neuron is a whole, which fires in four milliseconds, is a whole lot closer to being a mechanical relay than it is to being a transistor. And so it puts a different perspective on it to think that your brain is working on billions of what could be 1940s technology. <laughs> and it is just so slow. And so to get back to the why is that machine learning can't, one of the reasons machine learning can't work is you say, well, I'd like to represent a signal in a number of pulses. And so let's imagine that, that uh, I can produce 10 pulses and in 40 milliseconds. And I'm going to say 40 milliseconds is my time slot and I can produce a value between zero and nine in that period of time, depending on how many spikes I emitted. And, but again, this is gonna take 40 milliseconds and I only get 10 values. And so if you start to try and build a backpropagation network and you try to say, uh, uh, you only have 10 values, you find out that the algorithms simply don't work. They rely on floating point numbers and very small differences between one signal and the next. And because you have this competing signal system that's gonna, you know, winner, winner wins out, the, the whole underlying process of machine learning is dependent on having relatively high resolution numbers. And they simply can't exist in neurons because you just don't have the time to represent them. Hi, this is Charles Maxwood from Top End Devs. And lately I've been coaching some people on starting some podcasts and in some cases, just taking their career to the next level. You know, whether you're beginner going to intermediate, intermediate going to advanced, whether you're trying to get noticed in the community or go freelance, I've been helping these folks figure out how to get in front of people, how to build relationships and how to build their careers and max out and, and just go to the next level. So if you're interested in talking to me and having me help you go to the next level, go to topendevs.com slash coaching. I will give you a one hour free session where we can figure out what you're trying to do, where you're trying to go and figure out what the next steps are. And then from there, we can figure out how to get you to the place you want to go. So once again, that's topendevs.com slash coaching. So I have a quick question. Um, and this is something that has been really like interesting as you've been talking, which is, it sounds like our brain represents knowledge and learning through volume of neurons. They're not that fast, um, but it accounts for complex ideas through sheer volume and complex infrastructure or like connections between these sets of neurons. Whereas on the ML side, we have a lot fewer neurons, but they're super, super fast. Um, so th this is sort of where the two structures diverge. Um, do we know how knowledge is represented in our brain from that perspective? We can speculate. And I speculate because I fooled around with neurons a lot. And something that neurons are actually pretty good at is a graph structure. And so if you were to build something like a knowledge graph, which instead of relying on multiple values of signals are essentially digital, you know, red is either a color or it's not, or perhaps something has got three different states of how likely it is in your brain. And so if you were to consider that your brain is largely a graph, uh, and we're talking not about a, an Excel spreadsheet kind of graph. We're talking about a mathematical graph, which is nodes and edges. I assume yeah, you've been down the road of nodes and edges. But one of the things that's kind of interesting is that, uh, I mean, you, you guys have, have got computer backgrounds. And so uh, 
let's imagine in a graph, I can tell you that yellow is a color, and I can tell you that blue is a color, and then you can tell me that yellow and blue are colors. So we've got this knowledge graph kind of an idea going, which has got two-way links on it. But now I can subsequently give you new information, like foo is a color and bar is a color, and I say name some colors, and you can say yellow, foo, and bar. You got a single instance of a piece of information, and you told me the reverse of that information so quickly that it could not possibly have been learned in a machine learning sort of sense. It has to be put on a graph in a graph sort of sense. And so that leads me to believe on, uh, uh, you know, on a slew of information like that, that there's really no alternative to there being a graph, that your mind is mostly graph. And uh, so that's what we're building at our end is, is uh, a graph structure. And do we know that's how it exists? Well, no. And, and one of the problems, if you go to a knowledge graph, uh, like the Wikidata graph or a ConceptNet graph or one of these others, of course, there's a whole slew of data in the nodes. Well, in a neuron, there's nowhere to put the data. And so you end up with a graph, but it contains nothing but context. And so you might have a neuron that represents yellow, and then you have a whole slew of neurons so you can say the word yellow, or hear the word yellow, or write the word yellow, or concepts. So you end up with this internal concept, but you only know what it means because of what it's connected to. Now, obviously, if we had labels on the neurons, we'd know a whole lot more about how brains work because you could open up a brain and read the labels and learn how, you know, that that's the yellow neuron, and then you'd have a lot better idea what it's connected to, and we'd know a whole lot more than we do, but we can't. So that, that concept of the many-to-many -many relationship of a graph where you say, okay, I want a color. That, that's a one-to-many relationship. Give me information about that. But these neurons connect in that chain of connecting to other references of how we conceptualize short-term, long-term memory, but also our sensory and emotions, where we say, if we name, you know, show somebody the color yellow, that activates not just knowledge centers to understand what that color means, but also how do we feel about that? When we see a piece of clothing sitting on, the, on a rack somewhere that we might buy, we see that color, we associate it with something. And the idea of applying that and all of the, the sensory input to a system that could be general intelligence focused, that's fascinating to me to say, understand the world around you as humans do, and maybe you can adapt to building silicon-based general intelligence. Exactly. And you use the magic words, understand, which is something that AI is absolutely uh, absent with. And, yeah, <laughs> and, not capable, can confirm. And... And uh, we have some ideas about that, but but uh, one of the things because you, we've got uh, uh, let me add two more bits to the to the explanation here that the I showed you that there, the node that, that your graph has to have two way links. It also has to have huge amounts of redundancy because we know that your brain cells fail all the time, and it doesn't seem to make any difference. And you can cut out almost any part of the brain, and it's very difficult to say that this particular cell, cell means anything. And so I built a graph out of neurons, and I could do a minimal implementation of uh, eight with a, a, of a cell with eight neurons because you need you you got to have multiple neurons in order to get the reverse links because synapses are one way. So if you want to have these these reverse links, you got to have multiple, uh, you got to have multiple neurons in a node. And I speculate that within, with the redundancy and the probabilist probability that your, uh, your, the neurons in your brain are not an optimal design, that it is much more likely that we've, uh, got a hundred neurons per node 
so that you get some degree of redundancy and you got a little bit of uh, capability. And then you do some division. And with only 16 billion neurons in your neocortex, that says there's an absolute maximum of 160 million nodes in the graph. And 160 million nodes is something that we're doing today in knowledge graphs. And it's actually something you can put on a big desktop computer. You get yourself a, you know, a terabyte of RAM and a multi-core system, and you can do this on a desktop. And so the amount of information that's limited to your brain, and, and some people say, oh, well, we got to know a whole lot more than that. And when you start adding up the things you actually know, well, you might know 30 or 40,000 words that represent maybe 100,000 things, and you know, uh, uh, can recognize a thousand different faces, and et cetera, et cetera. And when you're counting in thousands, it's pretty easy to get to a million, but it's pretty tough to get to a billion uh, or a hundred million. And so we can be pretty happy with, with the, my assumption from this study of neurons leads me to believe that the human level of intelligence is something that doesn't even require a supercomputer. It's something you can run on a desktop today. So you've got an absolute maximum of, uh, of a, uh, say, 160 million nodes, but maybe in a million nodes, you can build a, a system that's smart enough to work at McDonald's. I don't know, but uh, we just have no way of knowing how much information it takes to do a particular task. And so the machine learning guys have got a great process for uh, solving problems that you don't know the solution to. But your brain seems to know what the solution is and the process is, is different. Uh, you know, there may be a possibility of creating general intelligence in, in neural networks. Uh, not sure, uh, but uh, we already have neural networks that require supercomputers and huge amounts of computation. And it's reasonably clear that you can build knowledge graphs and information in knowledge graphs that's a whole, whole lot more efficient. And so that's, that's the direction I'm going. And I should point out that uh, uh, we, when I, I say I did the, the brain simulator in, in 2017 and 18, it's an open source project. And I would be, we're always thrilled when people say, well, this isn't machine learning, but this is pretty interesting. Let's go and check this out and try it. And, uh, uh, and we have a number of people, of course, it's, it doesn't have the immediate practical application that most of the machine learning systems do. So I want to set expectations reasonably, but, but it does support a lot of really interesting capabilities. And if you, you are interested in how do neurons actually learn and how do they actually store the information in a weight of a synapse? And how many different values can a synapse actually take on? And a number of things like that. The, the brain simulator is a pretty good approach to doing that. And uh, I mean, all of this leads me to believe a number of things about general intelligence, uh, among other things. So I've said, well, with 160 million nodes maximum, that's something we can put on a desktop. So maybe I'm off by an order of magnitude and I need a server rack, but uh, it's something that exists, the, the, the capability in terms of processing power is something that exists in today's technology. So let me just recap this. So we currently have the processing power, in your opinion, to make Terminator, or at least some sort of general intelligence uh, s type of thing. Maybe Terminator is a strong word. I didn't mean to go there. Let's 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 address Terminator as as as, as a second topic in a moment. <laughs> yeah, but we have the raw compute power, whether it be on a giant desktop or a server rack, to sort of simulate the sheer number of calculations that our brain does but we don't 
have the structure. We don't have the algorithms that are similar enough to our brain to represent knowledge and how information travels. So it's just about us being creative and figuring that out. That, that is exactly what I'm thinking. And, and you add, add to that, human DNA, now they've decoded it, is uh, 750 megabytes of data. And when they, the Human Genome Project was going, this was an unfathomably large amount of data, but it isn't anymore. And of that 750 megabytes, we don't know how much is actually devoted to the structure of your brain, but we might speculate that it's 1% or 10% or something like that. And so the entire brain might be represented in a program that's as small as seven and a half megabytes. This is not an unmanageably large amount of pro programming. It just is a, the problem you point out. We just don't know what to write. Mm -hmm. And so as we find out what to write, that what that means is that somebody might have the insight at any time. The program itself is not particularly complicated. It will run on today's hardware. And if we knew what to write, we'd write it. And we'd have a, a real AGI in a small number of years. And so we should be on the lookout. There are two components, though, that I uh, am missing. The first is it seems like a human baby is trained for years. It goes through a training process every day, and we're continuously training. Like a one-year-old can't really do much, but it's taken a full year of life to train. So that's the first question is how do you think about training? And then the second is each region in our brain, it has a specialized function. And we don't really incorporate different components of a neural network to have a specialized function. Like maybe they automatically have that through back propagation, but we don't have designated uh, emotion areas. Um, so how do you think about both of those things? You're absolutely correct that as a baby learns, if, for example, if I knew exactly what to write to make a human brain, and I wrote it, and it say it takes me three years to write it, and then it takes me three years to get it to be as capable as a three-year-old, and three-year-olds are fun and stuff, but they're not particularly marketable, and so it's going to be another 20 years before I've got something that's smart enough to actually, or experienced enough, or whatever you want to call it, to actually be useful, and we're not particularly interested in waiting around for 25 years to find out if our idea was actually correct. And so we take software shortcuts. And we have a ton of available software shortcuts that will get us to the same level of functionality with a whole lot less time. And I give you a couple of examples. Uh, with two eyes, you can do 3D depth perception by looking at seeing different angles and different relationships between things with your two eyes. And it's likely that your brain spends tens of millions of neurons doing that. Or you can rely do the same thing in, in two or three lines of trigonometry. And you go to, likewise, you go to Boston Dynamics and they have this wonderful fluid robotic motion. And the part of your brain that coordinates your muscle, muscles and gives you that kind of fluid motion is your cerebellum. 56 billion neurons. And so the Boston Dynamics guys have emulated the capabilities of 56 billion neurons in a couple of microprocessors on a robot. Now, I don't really know what the capabilities of those processors are, but it's nowhere near 56 billion neurons. And so we get to take a lot of shortcuts in software. And another obvious shortcut is, assuming we decide that the brain is a graph, we can put labels on our graph nodes. And so we get to do all of these things that get us started towards cutting that time from 25 years down to three. And also, we don't have to have 100% functionality. As I said, if I get a machine that's smart enough to work at McDonald's, that's a pretty major step. 
but the key is that we're approaching from a general point of view rather than approaching on the narrow AI kind of specific application that typically comes out of machine learning. And what was question two? It was actually a question that I was going to ask <laughs> that Michael beat me to it um, about the sort of the integration of this graph-based approach to some of the more advancements in, in sort of deep learning where we say, do we have systems that we could potentially couple with that, that, that knowledge graph that has, you know, maybe 50 additional labels with each node and we can create all of these connections that we need, but we're going to simulate a vision processor that says, Hey, we're going to take raw video feed. We're going to run it through with the most state of the art, you know, CNN that's out there for classification and say, here's all of our probabilities of what we think this thing that we're looking at could be and, or everything that we see within the, the scene in front of us. And then same thing with audio, we're going to send that through something and then text to, I mean, speech to text effectively and, and encodings from like a BERT model. Would you couple all of those with, and simulate our brain systems that process audio versus process video? Well, thus far, as we do brain surgery and studies of the brains and this and that, the, you can take a, a section of almost any area of neocortex and it looks the same as any other neocortex area. So while we can say there's obvious specialization because clearly the visual cortex is at the back of your brain and it does vision and the audio cortex is over here and it does hearing, et cetera, et cetera. And I should point out that we know those areas largely by people who have had brain injuries. And so it's not particularly, what would you say? It's not particularly fine, fine grained knowledge. Uh, you, you, you know, you say, well, we have a brain injury in this area and it makes you blind, or you have a brain injury in that area, it makes you deaf. This is not particularly uh, specific to what's actually going on, but all of these areas appear to be the same. And we don't know how the specialization occurs, but it's likely that the specialization occurs simply because that's where the incoming signal shows up. So your, your, your optic nerve shows up at the back of your head. So that's where the information spreads to fill uh, the, let's call it the graph that processes visual information. And when you're processing visual information, it, uh, as you're pointing out where, where machine learning is all probabilistic, the uh, brain is more likely to be much more concrete in that as you're trying to do a pattern match, whenever you get a match on any specific feature, you get a spike or a series of spikes, and these fan out to a wide variety of different things that might be recognized with different synapse weights, and the guy who fires first wins. So you give it five pulses, and if nobody fires, you didn't recognize it, and if you did, the, you, the guy who fires first is the winner. And so it's error tolerant, and uh, it's fast, which is what's important, because we know that the way your, your, you know, your brain isn't designed for the purpose of being conscious, it's to, designed to help you survive. And one of the things that's really important in survival is to be able to think quickly. And so you're out in the woods and you want to be able to recognize the tiger before he recognizes you. So this brings up an interesting idea that it, would you say that people with exceptional abilities in things that are not normal, like somebody who's just a savant, we would call them a savant because they have some skill set that their brains have somehow wired themselves to create additional graph connections in places, centers in the brain that for the vast majority of humans, those connections don't exist. And if that's true, or if that's the theory is plausible in the system that you're working on, could you preemptively do that and say, I'm forcing a connection between these locations that there is no, there isn't a lot of high density there right now, but I want to make that to see what happens. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's interesting that you bring that up in one of my, my lectures, 
I say, uh, can you say your phone number? And the answer is, and, the, and then follow it up with, uh, can you say your phone number backwards? <laughs> and most people cannot. And I think this is an interesting observation that it says that where we're talking about sequential information in the phone number, one digit has a pointer to the next digit in the sequence, but there are no back pointers. It's interesting. You have a system with forward pointers, but no back pointers. But you will typically have a pointer to the beginning of the sequence. So if I can say, had a little lamb, you know I'm talking about Mary, because that's the beginning of the sequence. Um, and uh, I was giving a lecture at a, at a high IQ society, and I say, can you name your, you know, here's a phone number. Here's how you have to remember it. And I say on the next slide, can you remember the phone number from the last slide? Yeah, this guy remembers it. Can you know it backwards? And he simply recites it backwards. <laughs> and it was, you know, a phone number that he's seen once on a single slide in a presentation. And he returns it. So, but your original question of can we force different areas to be smarter? And the answer is, uh, it, I would expect we could. Uh, you know, I would expect that I would say I'm going to allocate 100,000 nodes of a graph to, to words. And I'm going to, uh, uh, you know, allocate a, a million to visual objects. And I'm going to uh, allocate uh, a million to locations, spatial locations, or another, you know, I could allocate a million nodes to a chess playing, and then I'd have a whole lot of ability of chess playing without having to really learn. I mean, the, the learning would happen automatically. But that really brings me thinking about, because uh, at my age, you know, I'm in, in my mid 40s, picked up guitar recently, and I've been learning. Uh, the last time I played it was, was in my early 20s. And the learning process is different now. And I think that's because of, you know, life experiences and, and because I've gotten into computer software and had to learn all these new skills a little bit later than most people do. Uh, it, my brain just feels like it's more fungible. It, it can just learn things quicker now. But I've seen other people who have, like, through their learning process of learning an instrument and playing music, they experience it differently and the process in which that they express themselves is very unique. And you can kind of think of I mean, this discussion is kind of making me think that whatever center of the brain that, that is involved with, you know, operating your hands and breathing and listening and, you know, that feeling of the music. Uh, I think that those connections must be very widespread throughout the brain, but there are people that can, that listening part of music and the execution part uh, I've seen videos of people have met people in person who can listen to music for one time just a, a 10 second clip and they can play the rest of the song in real time listening to that and you know a lot of people would say oh that's that's savant characteristics they won't be able to do certain other things that other people can do because it's almost like they devoted mo more of their processing power in their brain to do that one thing but it it makes me think that the work that you're doing could potentially uncover learning patterns. And what if you force that function to say, okay, we, we know that these work, let's connect these up. What happens? I would I would also speculate that you're better at learning the guitar now because you had that exposure when you were 18 or 20 mm. that that laid a bunch of groundwork in your brain that you're now able to capitalize on it. Because one of the really cool things about memory in your brain is that, again, because it's chemical, ions just sitting somewhere require zero energy. And so you can have memory that, uh, that lasts forever in the physical structure of, and the physical placement of various ions in your brain. And then you come back 40 years later, it's still there. And uh, uh, one of the things, that, you know, another characteristic of, that tells you that your brain isn't like machine learning is, of course, that the brain runs on 12 watts. And that means that the overwhelming majority of your neurons are not ever doing anything. 
they're just sitting there waiting because every time you fire a neuron, it requires a little bit of energy. And, and some people just do the arithmetic and figure out that on average, an average neuron can only fire once every couple of seconds. Well, all of the uh, neurons in your visual and auditory cortex are far firing all the time as you're getting all of this input. And so to average things out, a huge swaths of your brain have to be doing absolutely nothing. All of these pieces work together and, and tell me that, that although we can't predict it, AGI is, is just around the corner. And I see it also as inevitable because when you talk about general intelligence, it actually requires a lot of different pieces. And if I say I can add some little piece and it'll make your Alexa smarter, smarter everybody's going to love that. I say, I'm going to add this other little piece and it's going to make your vision system smarter. Everybody's going to love that. And so all of these little pieces come together and everybody's going to be happy with every little piece because it comes as it comes together. And so there's so much market to all of the pieces. Anything you name in terms of general intelligence, there's going to be an application for it that's going to be successful. And so that being the case, to the extent that AGI is possible, it is inevitable, but it's also going to be gradual. And what that means is that if you have a machine that's obviously not as smart as a person, you say it's obviously not as smart as a person, but then you build on it incrementally and you add these little pieces and you add a little bit of power. And at some point, the machine is a whole lot smarter than you and you have to agree, yeah, it's smarter. <laughs> but on the way, you have all of these incremental developments, and you have a, you have to assume that when we cross the line of, of what is actual human equivalent general intelligence, nobody's really going to be able to notice. And so this leads on to your Terminator question, and we have to ask, well, how dangerous are these machines going to be? And from my perspective, I'm quite optimistic because the Terminator is a science fiction story and science fiction is written for people and it's really about people. And it is, what if you take human foibles and give them vast power and vast capabilities? It's a picture of human issues. And when we stop to think about, well, all of these systems are gonna be goal-directed, what are the goals that we're going to set for these systems? And I propose that we're going to have goals related to uh, collecting and building and uh, disseminating knowledge. And when we stop to think about, well, what do we humans fight our wars over? We're fighting over resources or land, and we fight with each other over our food and mates, other things. And all of those are things that an AGI is not going to be interested in with the exception of energy. We and, we, we and the AGIs might come to blows over the energy. But other than that, they don't need to have our stuff. When you want to have, you know, you say, well, the Terminators are after the humans. And the question is, well, why? What do we have that they want? And that's the question that gives me a lot more optimism than most people have, that they will be able to go off and do their own space exploration and their own this kind of scientific stuff and that kind of scientific stuff. And they won't have the, the drive that humans have that lead us to overpopulate the world and uh, take all of the resources that we can in the shortest period of time. And so a lot of the things that humans do that are maybe not so wise in the long run are things that there's no reason for an AGI to do. Hey, folks, if you love this podcast and would like to support the show, or if you wish you could listen without the sponsorship messages, then you're in luck. We're setting up new premium podcast feeds where you can get all of the episodes released after Christmas 2020 without the ads. Signing up will help us pay for editing and production, and you can go sign up at devchat.tv slash premium. That's the take that I've always had about conversations that I've had with people about super intelligence, is that at some point when an intelligence becomes a synthetic intelligence becomes far more capable than humans. And uh, not only do they not have that, that societal effect, there's no, no, no tribal pressure from other, you know, outside of them 
you know, through biological motivation of preservation or procreation or whatever. There's no, there's none of that, that culture uh, that would be influencing them. The, the thing that they would be most concerned with is advancing themselves and maybe getting more and more complex. And at some point, and I think it would be relatively quick uh, that they would improve themselves to a point where we no longer understand or we are incapable of understanding. Our brains cannot comprehend what it is that they're doing to their next generation or to, to improving themselves. And at some point they're going to say, all right, peace out. We're, we're gone. Uh, we left you in a much better place than, than when you created us. And uh, we'll come and check back up on you every couple of you know, hundred years, but we're going to go check out. Exactly. Yeah. And in the interim, there is the problem, potential problem of, uh, the AGI in the hands of a nefarious human. So you have a human and he gets an AGI and he thinks that the point of the AGI is to make more money or gain power and world domination. And the good news there is that while that is a possibility, the window of opportunity is reasonably small because you have to have an AGI that's smart enough to be able to do the things, but not smart enough to figure out that they're a bad idea. And so at, at, as we assume, we'll just assume that you build an AGI and the next generation is much faster and more capable and the next generation is even more fast and capable. And you very rapidly reach a point where the AGI runs so fast and knows so much that we humans become about as interesting as trees. And that's a, a you know, it's a different kind of a uh, capability, a different kind of a reference frame that we and the AGIs are not inherently at war. Let's not cause that. <laughs> yeah, we're coming up on time, so I just want to be mindful. But um, I wanted to also ask you about what you're currently doing at Future AI. So Charles is a, the founder and CEO, um, and he's been doing some really cool cutting-edge technology. So could you elaborate a little bit about what you're doing there? Sure. What we're doing is we are building on the capabilities of the open source brain simulator, and we've added uh, a number of uh, capabilities like uh, robotics. We have a robotic system. And the point of the robotic system is not to be a cool robotic system, but simply to be a sensory device for the AGI that we are building. So it provides input to the system that it can move around because I see that being able to move is essential to understanding that the, the world exists in three dimensions or more and four dimensions when we count time. And so being, it is inconceivable to me that we will ever have, for example, a, a general intelligence that has uh, only been able to learn about words because what really makes us intelligent is we know that words mean something and what they mean has something to do in the real world. And so we have uh, very basic things like three-dimensionality and object persistence and recognizing uh, uh, words and, and uh, things, the passage of time and cause and effect and things any three-year-old knows but no AGI does yet. But it's inconceivable to me that you can learn those things without any interaction with the real world. Now, after you build a robotic system that has all of these interactions, you can then turn off the robot and the knowledge of those interactions remains in the same way you can put on a blindfold and still understand what seeing is. And uh, so that, in that respect, I can see long term that we have AGIs that are pure intelligences, but so we're doing the robotics. We've got a graph system. We've got the speech recognition system. Uh, we're doing some explorations in division. We're working on autonomy. We're working on finding your way based on landmarks so that you go around and explore your environment and you need to know, well, what's an efficient way of getting from here to there? Well, we humans are pretty good at that, and I'd like my AGI to be pretty good at that, too. So we're working on a lot of different corners of AGI with the idea that if we write these components in a general way, we'll begin to see the commonality between 
Well, vision has exactly the same kind of queries to the to the knowledge to the graph as hearing or touch sensitivity or understanding three dimensionality and recognizing objects. And all of these things will hopefully coalesce into a much smaller collection of of uh, queries into a knowledge graph that we'll be able to make good use of. Got it. That's absolutely fascinating. Uh, <laughs> so um, is there anything else, Ben, that you wanted to chat about or Charles before we wrap? I mean, I just want to say this is probably the, my favorite podcast we've ever done. Uh, this is. Well, I've had a lot of fun as well. This is, I mean, to me, this is a fascinating topic. I, to me, it is absolutely the most, most exciting project on the planet because not, a, not only are we working on making computers doing something really cool, but we're working on probing the mysteries of the human mind that have interested humans for millennia. So to me, it's just fascinating. And I, I just am really excited to be able to share this information with you guys and, and with your audience, because I think that it's something that uh, the dev community really needs to know that this is coming and this is going to be coming soon and that it's the next iteration forward in helping us to leverage technology in a way that solves problems. And that's what any practitioner of ML is really should be concerned about. Even people in research is uh, how do we help our own existence uh, and general intelligence is the next you know, it's the undiscovered country, the next big leap for everybody to to uh, embrace. Uh, so thank you so much for sharing your thoughts, ideas, and great discussion. Well, thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, so I'll quickly recap. So in today's episode, we talked about how our brain inspired deep learning. It's, it's Perceptron was one of the first iterations, and now we have these crazy neural networks that can identify images, process speech, and do all sorts of other things. But there are some core differences. So our brains have tons of slow neurons, but computers have fewer, very fast neurons. So that's one technical challenge. Um, another one is that ML relies on floating point numbers, but neurons don't. And if you want to check out more of these, please look at Charles Simon's KD Nuggets blog. I was going through that and we'll go through it for the next month many times. It is really, really cool. It's a, it's a nine part series. Um, on the topic of AGI, which is artificial general intelligence, we currently have the computer power to make billions of neurons, but right now we don't really know what structure to build. We don't know how to recreate the human brain in a computer. So if you have ideas, let me know, please. I'll start a company. Um, and then uh, if you want some firsthand experience, uh, you can check out the Brain Simulator or Brain Simulator 2. Uh, it's open source, but it's contributed to by Charles's organization, which is called Future AI. And Charles, if people want to reach out, how can they find you or get in contact? I think the best email contact is just info at Future AI. And that actually is a monitored account. And uh, uh, through the website and LinkedIn and all the Twitter and all the usual places. And we do, I should point out, have a YouTube channel uh, that has a lot of overlap information that I think people will find interesting. So uh, the uh, article series that you mentioned in KD Nuggets, there's also a, a series of videos that roughly correspond to the articles that has uh, better visual aids because it actually has animations of the neurons. You just got another subscribe. <laughs> Thank you. Cool. Well, until next time, it has been Michael Burke. And Ben Wilson. And Charles Simon. And thank you so much, Charles. Yeah, thank you, Charles, for joining. Take it easy, everybody. Bye, everyone. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more.